Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. And, and welcome, everyone. My name is Alan Northcott. I'm the president of Max Bell Foundation. It's my real pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the College Avenue campus uh, of the University of Regina. For those of us joining us, for those of you joining us virtually, we're just between downtown Regina and Moscana Lake. We're in the college building, the beautiful restored college building, originally built some 112 years ago. And this, of course, is Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory. We're on the original lands of Cree, Ojibwe, Salto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. I would invite you to join me in acknowledging the generations of peoples who have stewarded the waters and lands here long before our time. I would also like to share with you my small connection to this part of the world. I live and work in Calgary because my grandfather moved there in the 1930s with his parents and 11 sisters and brothers from a farm near Superb, which some of you will know is about 70 kilometers north of Kinderson. Calgary, where Max Bell Foundation is located, is Treaty 7 territory, traditional home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Gaina, Pigani, and the Sutina and Nakoda Nations and Métis Nation Region 3. For those joining us online, I would ask you to take a moment and think about the land acknowledgement that you might do from your own home about the long history of the land that you're on right now and the many generations of indigenous peoples who made their lives there before you did. And I would ask that we do this while thinking of the project of reconciliation as an invitation, an invitation to under, understand ourselves as part of a longer history, a shared history that obliges us to work together toward a better future. And with that in our minds and hearts, it is now my honor to introduce to you knowledge keeper Dennis Omeyasu, who has graciously agreed to start us in the Red Wing this afternoon. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah. Well, Regina is one of the homes of the Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy, JSGS for short. The other is in Saskatoon. The school, as you all know, bridges the two universities. JSGS offers six graduate programs, six master certificates, and a number of executive education options. And included in those offerings are an Indigenous Nation Veteran Certificate and a joint Master of Governance and Entrepreneurship in Northern and Indigenous areas. And as you'll see in a moment, Indigenous nation building, governance and entrepreneurship are at the core of today's conversation. We at Max Bell Foundation are delighted to be here co-hosting this event with JSGS. And I wanna thank the school for all that they've done to make today's event happen. And in particular, I want to single out Doug Moen, currently executive in residence at JSGS. Doug, as many of you will know, was deputy minister to the premier in Saskatchewan, and prior to that, deputy minister of justice and deputy attorney general. He's also a board member of the Expel Foundation. I also want to single out Karen jaster Board. There she is. Community Engagement Coordinator, JS Trias, who's been invaluable in pulling together the many, many details that go into event like today's. Thank you, Doc and Karen. We have an excellent panel and a patient panel, an excellent panel for you this afternoon. But before I introduce them, just let me say a few words about Max Bell Foundation. Max himself was born right here in Regina back in 1911. By any measure, he lived a very full life, living in BC, Quebec, and Alberta, and along the way accumulating considerable wealth almost all of which he left in the foundation that bears his name. Today, we manage an invested endowment of about $90 million, and our annual grants budget is about $3.5 million. And we make those grants to charities across Canada who are doing projects that aim to inform public policy. We have four pillars of interest, health and education, health and wellness, I beg your pardon, education, 
environment, and democracy. We also have a special but not exclusive interest in addressing those domains in ways that advance Indigenous communities. You can find out much more about us at maxbell.org. And if you think we might be able to work together, I urge you to get in touch. Okay, this afternoon we have the good fortune to hear from three truly terrific speakers on the future of the Indigenous economy. Ken Coates has agreed to play the role of moderator, although we hope he's also going to be an active participant in the conversation. Ken is Canada Research Chair in Regional Innovation at the JSGS. Ken was raised in Whitehorse and has long-standing professional and personal interests in Aboriginal rights, Northern development, Northern Canadian history, science, technology, and society, and Japan studies. Uh, with co-author Greg Polzer, Ken recently published a book called From Treaty Peoples to Treaty Nation. He has previously published on topics such as Arctic sovereignty, Aboriginal rights in the Maritimes, Northern treaty and land claims processes, regional economic development, and government strategies for working with Indigenous peoples in Canada. Tabitha Bull is President and CEO, Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Tabitha is Anishinaabe, a proud member of the Nipissing First Nation, serving the Indigenous community through CCAB's commitment to support the Indigenous economy. Tabitha is often asked to provide input to the federal government, including recent attendance at the 2023 North American Leaders Summit, which include delegates from Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. An appointee of the Catalyst CEO Advisory Board, Tabitha collaborates with some of the world's most powerful CEOs and leading companies to help build workplaces that work for women. She is also a member of Queen's University Dean of Engineering Circle of Advisors, Centennial College's Indigenous Circle, C.D. Howe Institute's Energy Policy Program, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce Board, and the Board of Dextera Group. Tabitha is dedicated to diversity and removing systemic barriers to improve opportunities and business competitiveness across industry sectors. And Chief Cadmus Thorne, a Cree and Salto, is currently serving a second term as Chief of Cowes' First Nation. He earned a master's degree in 2016 on what the news tells me was the day before he was elected <laughs> as his first term as chief. Chief Alarm's leadership has seen many achievements at Cowes' First Nation. I'm going to mention just a few. First, the establishment of Cowes' Ventures, an umbrella organization responsible for the nation's business endeavors and industry partnerships that include, among other things, renewable energy and urban development projects. Chief Red Bear Children's Lodge, was established. It's a new Cowessus run child and family services agency on the reserve and a new judicial system. Eagle Woman Tribunal will review and make decisions regarding child welfare and other matters on appeal pertaining to Cowessus citizens. Welcome panelists. And one last note before I hand the microphone over to Ken is I would invite you all to stay after the presentations for a hosted reception so we can talk on them. Great. Alan, thank you for a uh, gracious introduction to uh, two wonderful colleagues here. You're going to enjoy this session a lot. These are folks with uh, a stunning amount of insight and knowledge about what's going on in the Canadian economy who managed to balance realism with a sense of adventure um, and a real sense of vision for how the future can unfold. And I think the topic here of the future of the Indigenous economy, I think both of them are going to tell you that the future actually started some years ago. Uh, and then we're in the middle of that transition. This is not something we're a fanciful vision for the future. I love what the elder had to say, Elder Dennis, uh, the knowledge keeper, when he talked about transitions, because I think those are really, really important. And I think in Canada, we're facing some really interesting transitions that we're going to ask both of you to sort of, I get to ask all the questions, don't have to give any answers, but I love, I love this that part of the role, um, is that if you, if you watch the news, you would basically be overwhelmed with stories of, of despair overwhelmingly i mean and, and with, with good reason if you actually knew the details of what's going on with the opiate crisis in many particularly in northern communities it is staggering beyond belief i was in the yukon last week and was actually talking to one of the community members there four people died in a community of 150 people uh, in one month uh, this is not a small thing this is right in the heart and soul of, of, of communities and you can go through the long list. We know this stuff pretty well, overcrowded housing. And we know the problems with water supply. We only back to only talk about part of the problem with water supply. We know the poverty levels. We can we know all that stuff. 
And, and we're, we're here because we think we can change it, collectively and, and individually change it. The other part that we don't talk about very much is the fact that Indigenous entrepreneurship is actually the fastest growing part of the Canadian economy, that Indigenous people, particularly Indigenous women, are changing the rules of how capitalism works and how economic development works. Uh, they're reshaping it. Um, I've heard Tabitha on this. You, you educated me very well, Tabitha. I did pay attention. Um, and, and, and you watch people like Chief uh, Cadmus, who, who actually, not to put a personal thing on it, because he's, he's in my class, I can still change his grade if I, if I want to, um, is, is something like, like Chief Cadmus had a phenomenal series of opportunities that when he finished his, his studies. He could have gone to Ottawa, he could have gone to Regina, he could have gone into business, he could have made an awful lot more money. But he chose to do the one thing that was perhaps the most important, and that was to commit, commit himself to his community. And he took his learning, and he took his knowledge, and he took his, his spirit and his energy, and he went back home, which I think is an absolutely wonderful thing for him to have done. I hope we're going to talk a little bit about, about Kaosis, but if you if you if he doesn't, because he's a pretty modest guy, I'll tell you about it later on, because Kaosis has been turned on its head and is now an exemplary exemplar of what an indigenous community can do in less than a decade to actually set us up on a new course. So you're gonna hear lots of really, really interesting things. I'm gonna start off with a really bold, huge, big question. Ask Tabitha first to give Cadmus a chance to get his notes together. Um, <laughs> but the question is a really important one. Can the Canadian economy be reimagined? Can we actually change the way the Canadian economy works in such a way that indigenous entrepreneurs, indigenous businesses, and particularly communities actually have an opportunity to be included in Canadian prosperity? really for the first time in 200 years, in a manner that actually still respects Indigenous values um, and Indigenous aspirations. That's what's at risk here. That's what's at stake here. That's the belief. Can we actually do it, Tabitha? Mm -hmm. First, Ani, Tabitha, Indigenous Cause, Nipsey, Indigenous Dodem, thank you all. It's an honor to be here. I'm a, a signatory to the Robinson Huron Treaty, so it's an honor to be able to be here today. Thank you, Alan, Max Bell, and I am it's really an awe to share space. I think your mic is off. Hold on. You got to turn it on. Oh. And then turn it on. There we go. <laughs> there we go. If anybody didn't hear me up there, sorry. On the Zoom. It was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I just introduced myself in my own uh, initiative, Moen, to say thank you for being here. Uh, but I, I want to say that I am in, uh, truly honored to share space with you today. Uh, I. We had a chance to sit on a panel, I think like 2019, at some point, uh, talking about energy projects when I was really focused on the energy space, but I've watched you from afar. I'm so in awe of what you've done. Thank you. Um, so to answer, start with the question, can the Canadian economy be reimagined? I think um, I, my answer is yes, but my answer is yes, because it has to be. We really, as a country, will not be able to move forward on on clean energy transformation, on looking at where we're faced right now with supply shortages and where we're faced with uh, workforce shortages, if we don't ensure that we're including Indigenous people and communities and businesses in all of our conversations towards public policy, towards research, towards how we're ensuring that all of our programs to support entrepreneurs ensure that we include Indigenous business. And as you said, we see that Indigenous entrepreneurs are growing, but we definitely saw over the last two years at CCAB that just that, not a surprise, but the resilience of Indigenous business through a time when all the businesses were facing difficulties, but even more so Indigenous businesses who were, you know, located on reserve where they did not have uh, access to high-speed internet, but so many businesses were, you know, let's move to e-commerce solutions and let's find ways that we can support businesses to to change to e-commerce or to adopt digital programming, but but that funding only goes so far and it doesn't go far enough if we don't have access to proper infrastructure in communities. So I, there, we can get there, but we need to ensure that we understand that we're not going to get there unless we find ways from the outset through policy to ensure that we're including Indigenous businesses, to ensure that we're looking at the growth of our Indigenous youth population and finding ways to ensure that that we're with the youth when they're you know, young in public school and saying, these are the opportunities to be an engineer, to be a doctor, or this is what it means to be in finance. Um, you know, until 1951, if you got a degree in 
at an engineer or a doctor or a secondary degree, you are no longer considered an Indian under the Indian Act. So I'm I'm an engineer by training. Um, I would not have, have been considered, no longer been able to be a member of my community, been able to be part of my community. And that means that our youth lost that. They lost those mentors. They lost that, you know, we say so often now, like, if you can see it, you can be it. But youth, just like my own generation, didn't have that growing up. So we need to really focus on how we're ensuring that we're correcting those ways that we were really systematically and purposely excluded from that economy. So for sure we can reimagine, but it's going to take some work and we need to double down on those efforts to go back and repair what, what has happened and how we have been excluded and, and look from the outset. And I know because this is a public policy school and it's Max Bell Foundation, when we talk about that, things we talk about at CCAB are so much about when those public policies are written, we need public policy writers and advisors and government to think, does this work for an indigenous business? So a prime example of that is during COVID, um, the wage subsidy came out. Um, Aboriginal Economic Development Corporations have as part of their structure, First Nation communities as a shareholder. When that wage subsidy program first came out, it excluded any organization that had a government as part of a shareholder. The reason, and Chief Shalom can talk more to this than I can, but the reason it's structured that way is because it reduces risk for a bank. So it's structured that way because of the Indian Act, because of the restrictions that government has put on us. But then when we got to the wage subsidy program, we also weren't able to apply for the wage subsidy. But it took us having to go back to government and meet with ministers and meet with finance to say, these organizations who support so many Indigenous and non-Indigenous employees and Indigenous community programs can't apply for this wage subsidy program, and they can't because of the Indian Act. And we were able to get that changed, and that, you know, that is like a huge moment of, of pride and a huge moment of why we're continuing to do what we do. But we need to be thinking about, we can be reimagined, but what are we doing at the outset to ensure that that's possible? Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Chief Cadman, same question. Can, can the Canadian economy re, be reimagined in a way that's truly inclusive of and incorporating Indigenous aspirations? Thanks, Ken. Uh, good afternoon. I know Dennis left, but thank Dennis and thank Alan and all the uh, presenter. Uh, it, it is. It, it's happening. Uh, is it happening at the pace that we all want? Uh, no, it's not. And um, our, our biggest enemy in it is uh, the machine that runs it. it it's, it's a really big machine. The whole Westminster system, the uh, Constitution, Section 91 and 92, uh, the Indian Act, and so forth. But the other challenge is between our ears and, and, and as individuals. Um, we live in a Western worldview that, that we're all accustomed to. Our, our assets are our homes, our vehicles, our, our bank accounts, and you know, we're safe where we're in a very, very good place in, in a G7 country. But there's an indigenous worldview that that's also here. And the Western worldview pie isn't getting bigger. What are we able to sacrifice the massage in the indigenous worldview that always should have been here? And that's the challenge that we face today is how do we now do that? We wear orange shirts on September 30th. We do take part in, in Aboriginal Day on June 21st. We now take part in, in Ribbon Skirt Day on June 4th. Like our hearts are here. But the thing is, is that question is going to be is how did this benefit me? That's the kind of generation we live in today is how does this benefit me? And so is it happening? It's happening. But it's happening at the pace that deep down where we only allow it to happen. At this pace, it's not going to get better. We have to make big change. And it starts with bigger than just the Indian Act. It starts with more than just, you know, investing in the education systems. Like those are really important drivers. But in order to change the whole, you know, forward thinking is... I'll go back to 1867. I'm going to make my answer really quick here, but I'm going real far back now. Section 91 of the Constitution gives federal jurisdiction and responsibilities. 
Section 92 gives provincial jurisdiction and responsibility. Those are two major policy drivers for economics in our country. Where is Indigenous jurisdiction and responsibilities? We can't just say Section 35 is the solution, but that isn't the solution. Section 35 is to respect the inherent rights and, and the laws Indigenous people have, like the child welfare law. But how do we drive an economy when we look at our own Westminster system and we're still not opening up that big major con conversation is where do we mend our major legislation to let this drive forward? We can't just rely on um, our, our private and, and our businesses and our entrepreneurs. You're going to make difference in one to two to three families out of 10, but we're actually going to create an even bigger gap of the have and have nots. And, and that is why this is so big. And now I can go on about between our ears and what we have to change, but I'm assuming that question might come up in a little bit. <laughs> uh, in various forms, I think, by the time we're done, she. Um, and just a quick observation, I'm, I'm from the Yukon, and the Yukon started a land claims process in 1973. So 20 years to negotiate a modern treaty. And they've now been spent 20 years more, 30 years now, trying to, trying to implement it. And there may be about 10% of the way. These are long, long, long processes. But what I would say is that, in fact, the Yukon has done what you've described, where you have a situation where Indigenous people are so integral, integral to the political process that you actually cannot do a mine or a road or a major building without involving Indigenous folks, mm -hmm. right? And I think one of the processes from a policymaker's point of view, we're so used to thinking that policy starts in Ottawa and emanates out sort of like, like you know, papal bulls coming out of Rome, way across the country, bringing wisdom and hope and opportunity, not the way Canada works. And in fact, Canada's often worked from the regions coming some of the best ideas and bringing them to Ottawa. Now they're coming from the North and from communities that are deeply engaged with Indigenous peoples. And that's where some of the most interesting stuff in the country is coming from. Not from Toronto, not from Vancouver, but actually from Old Crow and from, from Yellowknife. It's kind of an interesting thing. Let's start this on a really positive note. And there's so many good reasons to be positive. I'm not sort of trying to put the rest of it behind. But, but I want you to sort of each one of you identify what you, two good examples. Not everybody knows about the achievements in, in terms of Indigenous economic involvement. Things, things that are just standing, or they can be small things and they can be huge things. But interest, I'll go to you first, and if you don't mind, Tabitha. Sure. Um, just what do you think are two big things, two, two things that have done that show what's possible? And so I have two, two, a big and a small such story. So Hydro One, Hydro One is our transmitter in the province of Ontario. Their assets cross about 35 uh, First Nation communities in Ontario, but they deliver electricity to 108, I think. Uh, so back in 2017, 2018, there was a, a process in which Hydro One became a private company. It's still 49% owned by the province. But in that process of it becoming a private company, a portion of its shares were purchased by 120 First Nation communities in Ontario. So First Nation communities in Ontario actually now own a portion of the transmitter that has crossed so many of their territories. Uh, so that big win, and, and that was a, a very long process. It was also a process that had to be ratified, and, and I think the requirement was 98% of the First Nations in Ontario had to approve, so not an easy process to get to. Um, this year, Hydro One has announced that every project that is over $100 million, so every transmission project in Ontario that's over $100 million, they have committed to have 50-50 equity participation with First Nation communities. So there's one project that's already going forward in Northwestern Ontario that has six communities that will own 50% of that line, but there's six new transmission lines coming up in the Southern part of Ontario that will all be eligible for 50% equity ownership from uh, the First Nation communities that, that, that those lines are crossing. There's still a, a ways we have to go to ensure that those communities have the capacity to be able to be equity partners in those projects, but that's a very, that's a huge, a huge commitment from a, a provincial transmitter. Um, the second, the second is a, a very new story that I'm really excited to share. So there's a Indigenous entrepreneur uh, from Manitoulin Island in Ontario. He owns a company called Bird Shark Coffee that he just started five or six years ago. Um, the company has social values throughout the entire system. So for every 10 bags of coffee, 50 bags of coffee that are sold, um, they provide one water treatment uh, system to a home in a First Nation. 
The labels that are made are made by an organization that employs disabled and, and uh, workers with Down syndrome specifically. Um, it is, you know, sustainable products, sustainable farming. So really focused on that social value and giving back. They've just uh, made a deal with Costco to be in Costco stores across all of Canada. It's a million dollar a deal per year. Um, so those bags will be across across all Costco stores with it's the one, they have about five different types of flavors of coffee, but this is called the Nookshuk, um, but really tells the story also about the water crisis on every bag of coffee and, and why purchasing that coffee is important. Great, great examples. Chief? I can narrow it down to three. I got to share three. I think I have so much. Uh, the first one is, is uh, on Albert Street, there's a Tim Hortons uh, on Cows' property. When we started developing that, uh, we had to budget an extra $100,000 to convince the Department of Justice that a Tim Hortons was a low risk to Canada on status land. So that is a common example. Yeah, that makes you cough. Huh? <laughs> That's a common example of why it's so tough to build on Indian Act status land. And so that's just, you know, and then when we were dealing with Tim Hortons, um, I tell you, I've negotiated land claims in my time, but negotiating with Tim Hortons is a whole new level. <laughs> but, but today you can get a beautiful warm coffee uh, at a Tim Hortons on status land in this city. The second one is agriculture. When you study Treaty 4, which we recognize in, in our speeches today and where we're, we are, every Indigenous nation should have been successful farmers today because agriculture was a promise. Why is it today that there are almost no indigenous farming? And in, that, that, that's just a, a realization. In 2016, when I got elected, I, I made my mandate. I'm like, we're gonna become farmers because we got to implement treaty. That's our obligation too. So internally as an indigenous to indigenous, indigenous nations have some historical land issues so we have to deal with that first. And we dealt with it, check mark. And then we started to consider farming. And uh, farming is not a cash cow. It's something that you uh, grow in. A lot of farms in our area are generational. And so uh, we went to FCC, Farm Credit Canada. They're like, no, we don't deal with First Nations on reserve because of Section 88 of the Indian Act. There's no assets. You don't own your land. We went to the banks. They're like, no, we, we can't deal with you. You don't even own your land. How do we even loan you money? And so internally, we went to our own our own internal money and even our own internal on cows. And we're like, we're not farmers anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my gosh, we got to do this. <laughs> As of today, we farm 7,000 acres of grain farm. It took us five years to convince Farm Credit Canada that we are a customer of theirs. It took us three years to convince co-op that they can give us lines of credit. And today, you know, and just give an example, we made about $700,000 in net profit in last year's crop, which we are reinvesting to buy all of our lines of machinery, like houses. We're going to be a 15,000 acre grain farm in the next six years because that's our obligation of treaty, but policy and the Indian Act and these institutions that support Canadians, they, today they still don't know how to address indigenous on status land that's just a reality but there's a success story there my last one and really quickly is renewable energy so right now cows we have finalized a 360 million dollar turbine project in this province it, it's signed it's it's going to shovels in the ground right away when we were negotiating this we were dealing with uh, million dollar companies like companies a first nation would never even think that we're at that level with them and if there's times in the meetings, and we're great relationships, but there's times in the meetings I would have to remind them that we're eye to eye. Like just because, you know, sometimes indigenous nations, when you're looked at from huge industries, you know, you're just a little player. We're like, and I, I would remind them in meetings, I'm like, am I, is my chair lower? Am I, why, why are you looking down at us? I'm like, we're eye to eye here. Like that's how you treat us and that's how we'll treat you. And then it came to the grants that Canada gives. Canada gives grants to Indigenous people because of inequality. 
That grant is for Kaosis' equity, the B I to I. Some industries will think, well, let's share this pie because it's taxpayer dollars. No, this is Kaosis' equity because we weren't allowed to do this till 15 years ago. So we want to be at your level. And so it takes attitude adjustments, not only on industry side, but even indigenous side. Like there was times I had to remind our team, you got to remove that chip off your shoulder. This isn't racism. This is business. This isn't ignorance. This is business. And reconciliation has a ceiling in some of those rooms. When you start to really affect their net profit, reconciliation isn't a conversation anymore. And so, you know, you just have to be always calm and ready. And today, Kauses has uh, those three stories just in successes. But there's a lot of things that you have to overcome to get there. That wonderful stories, really examples on, on all, all five of them. I only asked for two. I, 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 I can't control this guy. Um, but it's interesting. You know, one of the one of the examples of this, just to sort of aggregate a little bit higher, is that across the country there are probably ten or twelve agreements within the last two years that are worth more than a billion dollars. I was in the Maritimes a couple of weeks ago, and they're dealing there with uh, Clearwater uh, Seafoods. Well, Canada's largest seafood company purchased by member two First Nations is 50% owner of the company. Um, and the non-Indigenous folks, so sort of their first reaction was kind of shock horror, like, well, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, well, it means that instead of dealing with ownership in Halifax, we were dealing with ownership in member two, they were good business people, these guys are good business people, and it's actually working out really well. But to have that scale, you know, I'm old enough to remember when if a First Nation person bought a part of ownership of a gas station, that was headline news. That was, wow, they're, you know, they're, they're breaking out from their poverty, right? Now, you know, they own the gas chain. They don't just own the gas station anymore. And that kind of stuff's really exciting. So let's flip around the other way. And, and we talked about the achievements. So give us each a couple of barriers, things you think that are really stopping First Nations, Inuit, Métis people from sort of getting ahead. Kind of implicit in a few of the comments here from the chief. But but uh, again, um, Tabitha, what do you think the barriers are that are still getting in the way of Indigenous entrepreneurs? But I think one is definitely, as the chief said, the land code and land management act. So if there are only, so if you are in a community and want to potentially lease part of the land or how you develop the land and you don't have a land code agreed to and approved by the federal government, uh, you, you cannot make those business deals without going through that process. And there are only, I don't know the number of how many communities now have a land management, a land management act. So they've had to go through a process to determine what parts of their land will be residential, what will be for business, what could possibly be leased. And that has to be approved by their community, but then also by the federal government. And that process is still taking five to seven years for approval at the federal government level. So if we if there's there are these opportunities for renewable procurement, as an example, and partners are going to communities wanting to partner potentially and and as you know real partners and which could potentially bring revenue to the community um that process is going to take five to seven years through the government and that that doesn't work at the regional level of of procurement so the land issue is still a very big issue uh specifically for communities um and then you know we hear time and time again capital so access to capital and part of that is because of the same reason uh, you know, Farm Credit Canada would say, well, you don't own the land. So as an entrepreneur who wants to build a business uh, on reserve that doesn't have that collateral for the land, there are still barriers there um, uh, when going to most of the major banks. And the major banks are working on solutions, and there are solutions now, solutions for, you know, my parents being able to get a mortgage for their house on reserve, which was never a possibility before. Uh, but we're st we still have a lot of ways to go there. And then I think I really find the other barrier is just that same for capital, but social capital like that. Those rooms that Indigenous. So my, I grew up in I live in Toronto now. I have two boys. They are fourteen and seventeen. They both play hockey. They we live in a nice neighborhood in Toronto. Their access to social capital, like the the parents of their friends, are people that I never would have imagined knowing myself growing up. And even when I introduced my dad or my mom to these, you know, who are now my friends, like this is the COO of Amex Canada, my parents are like, how do you know the COO of Amex Canada? And, but that is so integral to, especially a budding entrepreneur, 
So my kids have this opportunity to be able to go to that person who's driven them to hockey practices and say, hey, I want to start a business. What do you think? And get all of this advice or connections or so. So that social capital, I think, is something that we need to really work on. And that's something that you know, our organization is that's part of why we exist to bring those opportunities together and those network opportunities together. Um, and because you had three and you only got two, I'm going to do it. <laughs> It's it's it ties to social capital, but it's also about the rooms that we are in. So, um, you know, Alan spoke about I had this incredible opportunity to be part of the Canadian delegation at the North American Leaders Summit in Mexico City at the beginning of the year. So there was 15 Canadian business leaders, 15 Mexican, 15 U.S. Canada was the only delegation that had Indigenous voices there, and all three of those countries had First Nation Indigenous inhabitants before they were country. And to me, that is what, to me, it's a, it was a huge responsibility for me to be in that room and, and have that voice in a, in a table that we would have never had a voice at before. Um, but my biggest intervention in that meeting was you all need to have Indigenous people here. We're not going to move forward on, on trade and climate change and the, the priorities that we're all thinking about if we're, we don't have Indigenous people at this table. And they did all commit by the end of the the day that they would all have been just so the next. So, Fantastic. Uh, the question is about entrepreneurs. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, right now in this country, uh, the territories, the province, and Canada are meeting on the 15 year plan for agriculture in our country. Um, well, I, I was in Ottawa recently and we were I was talking to the Department of Agriculture. I was like, so who's the Indigenous voice at this table? And they're like, well, the provinces are there. I'm like, so you're thinking the province is speaking on behalf of cows for, for agriculture? I was like, you can't just assume that. Like, you, like, who is your indigenous voice here? So we just got to make sure that, you know, the entrepreneurs being indigenous, and then this is where I'm going to leave my answers with the indigenous. Indigenous entrepreneurship is growing rapidly. But there are a lot of sex successes and failures. The failures we don't hear as much as the successes. When I'm talking with entrepreneurs that are Indigenous, I, I'm always questioning. I do it like steps. They choose a project and then they, they just run with it. And, and they just, you know, as they're on the fly, they're changing it and stuff like that. And it's really tough. I, I remind them, I'm like, you got to ask your first question. Where's your jurisdiction in your entrepreneurship? <laughs> what are you doing? What's your you gotta know your jurisdiction because as indigenous people, if it's on the reserve, your jurisdiction's differently. If you're trying to use the tax bracket, make sure you're incorporated. You gotta know your jurisdiction. The second thing is what institutions support you? You know, is there banks that are gonna support you? Is it your First Nation chief and council that's gonna support you? You gotta identify your institutions, then you choose your projects. So you're missing those two foundational things as an entrepreneur. And many have succeeded jumping into a project and running with it. I, I just give it up to them. Like it's like <laughs> science and art. I tell them we figured it out. But I noticed those first two steps in a lot of entrepreneurship discussions, that's where they failed. Is they just they got confused because when they went to implement, the jurisdiction and institutions weren't there to support them. The second part is, is an indigenous entrepreneur is a leader. They're a creative, innovative leader. And I'm not trying to ask for pity or for to feel sorry for any Indigenous person with what I'm about to say, but you carry the weight of your family. You carry the intergenerational trauma. You carry the weight of the history that we just inherited as Indigenous people. You know, when, a, when, when an overdose happens or a suicide happens or, or, or you know, you're families just not meeting those those regular requirements the, the quitting of school the, the giving up the 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 mold in the house is like an entrepreneur carries that and you don't see that when they're front line trying to be successful and again we're not asking for pity we're not asking for anybody to feel sorry for us but you just got to understand an entrepreneur carries that weight with them as they're trying to succeed, because usually the entrepreneur is the leader in their family. And families, we're getting stronger. We're very, and we're, we're, we're here. 
But you just got to remember that when you see an entrepreneur, praise them because you don't know the weight that they're carrying on their shoulder as they're succeeding. As in fact, I heard you speak a number of times, uh, Chief, about the sort of the intergenerational trauma, and you didn't see the Chief's comments about the uh, discovery of uh, discovery, the sort of attempt to sort of identify the graves of, uh, on, on the Kaos' First Nation. He gives some brilliant international leadership on, on that particular issue. And most importantly, I think, was the fact that you gave a new voice to intergenerational trauma. And so we got from beyond the buzz line to the fact that this is people's lives. And I think it was really, really important. Let's look a little bit at the question of sort of location and, and how that affects opportunities for, for Indigenous folks. And use an example from Vancouver. Um, during the build-up to the, the Olympic Games, um, the Olympic Committee made a huge commitment to the First Nations to actually have them be part of the, of the Olympic movement. And, and I'm not sure if you ever want to see something truly spectacular. Go back and watch the full opening ceremonies for the, for the Olympic Games. And they were introducing the head of heads of state. I'm not sure how many of you saw this, but they were all the heads of states came out and all these you know, princes and prime ministers and all that kind of stuff. And they introduced the four First Nations from the Vancouver area as heads of state. And it was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. You know, I tingled and oh my God, I can't believe I'm watching it. And Vancouverites have sort of been, they didn't expect this. You could see they understood it. And it was just like people almost broke down. It was really, really quite something, right? If you went to Vancouver, you will now see at least three projects that are worth more than $3 billion, owned entirely by First Nations people. Uh, they're going to build apartments, one project, apartments for 7,000 residential apartments in, the, in the downtown Vancouver, right? Wow. Easy to do, right? All right. Now we're talking about Fond du Lac. And now we're now we're talking about about you know any one of the remote communities that are sort of more than a hundred kilometers away from big cities. You know what are the unique challenges and potential for remote communities, Chief? We'll start with you this time. What what can they do to make sure they're part of this economic transition? Are we is we're we're moving as a country towards city state economies where the, almost all the real wealth is going into about seven communities, big cities. You know, Tabitha is going to be fine, but the chief and I won't be. Um, big, big cities doing extremely, extremely well. What do we do to make sure that the remote and rural communities benefit from this economic transition as well? It, it's a good, this province is a very prime example. Um, you know, I, I, I benefited from living in southern Saskatchewan, a long number one highway. Um, you know, we're we're an hour and forty minutes from a Costco. That, that's how you know you how far you like from the city. And um, you know, we we have opportunities. Agriculture is Kausis's future. And renewable energy is Kausis's future. That, those are the two things keeping close to home. And you want to create capacity, and you want to create jobs in your reserves, in your communities, at, at, at the home, at the home uh, area. But that you cannot do that alone in this province as a First Nation. you got to diversify. And so first off is what is in the region. You take Fond du Lac. People may agree or disagree at the extraction of resources. But the thing is, is if Fond du Lac is in the backyard of a diamond mine, um, a resource uh, company, Today, with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, on uh, Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, it is industry's obligation to now go and not just give $100,000 and think that that's the solution. Like, as long as that area is growing, Fond du Lac should be growing with it. If it's not, then that, inst that, that industry have to check themselves again. I'll give you a little example. I'm not going to chalk up Enbridge because I'm friends with them, but I want to give you the example of Enbridge. They built line three through Treaty 4 five years ago. And through the whole time, I kept telling them, well, what are you doing to help houses benefit on this line three? And so, you know, we got a few jobs. We got some investment dollars to help with our haul. Line three right now is pumping you know, one of our big resources through our, our land and Kausis is still sitting here. And there was a missed opportunity there. And so I'm just giving an example. My last comment is how you, you can benefit is you got to purchase status land 
all over, not just keep your reserve there. For example, cows is owned land in Europe in Saskatoon, Regina, because of treaty land entitlement. So we are now benefiting. If you go to that Tim Hortons on Albert Street, houses benefits from that. You know, we're building renewable energy projects right now. We're trying to be a part of the next Costco in this city. We're trying to develop something there now. Like, so you got to buy urban land as well. That's how a First Nation will grow in the future. English River does it well. They're in the north, but that gas station, when you get to South Saskatoon, that's English River. So when you go in there and give them services, that profit may go back to their northern community. So you got to find ways to diversify. Excellent. Thanks, you, Tabitha. Rural and remote communities. Yeah, I think I think one thing I just want to talk about is that we think when we think about remote communities and the impact, such specifically when we talk about broadband, I think we often think really remote. But my parents live at Nipsing. My community is about about a 10 minute drive from North Bay, like a very large city in, in Ontario, like mid-sized city, but they have really great high speed internet. And during uh, COVID, when we were all working from home, I spent some time in my community with my parents and I had the opportunity to be on a couple of Zoom calls with some ministers and it was very clear, like trying to keep my camera on, but, but I couldn't really participate fully in those conversations. and. I mean, it was kind of a great opportunity because I was like, oh, I'm just home visiting my family and Nipissing First Nation. Sorry, I have to take my, like, turn my camera off because it's not remote. Like, it's a three-hour drive from Toronto. It's, and same with Six Nations, very large community just outside of Hamilton, big city. Um, but the entrepreneurs in that community struggle with their e-commerce. So I think we need, to, like, we often think when we think the broadband issue is something that's really remote, but it's really not. It's really just communities that are, too small for or for companies to price per customer deliver the broadband or high speed internet that's needed. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's you know definitely movements for us to move forward on on pushing that forward. And and I you know to the same point I think we we are seeing a lot of opportunities for partnerships between communities as well. So communities that are in the north or in rural are able to partner with a community that has an opportunity to benefit on a transmission project, but maybe they don't have the capacity or the equity. So those type of partnerships we're seeing as, as a big success as well, for if there's some type of opportunity in your, in your territory. To yeah. I was uh, talking to one of the chiefs from another part of Saskatchewan, not from down south here, and a very entrepreneurial man. And I sort of said, okay, you're building all these companies. These are all sorts of companies under development. You probably figure out who it is. And I said, how much are you putting into your reserve community? And he said, nothing. He said, because the bureaucrats have put it there, picked the worst place in Saskatchewan to build a town. There's no, that, and, and that was a decision made in the 1870s to force our people to live there. Why would we reinforce a really bad decision made by people in Ottawa 150 years ago? So he said, our traditional territory 500 miles east to west, 300 miles north to south. I'll support our community anywhere they are, which actually reinforces Chief's point. You know, because actually what you're talking about here, one says, you know, Regina is the traditional territory of Kaosis, right? And so that, that whole idea that they should reinforce the reserve as some sort of sacred entity, that's a government creation. In the Canadian North, most of those places weren't occupied until the 1950s, which is kind of really interesting. Although know, they're 1950s, 1960s creations. They didn't even exist before then, so the government came along and sort of set up those, those kind of reserve situations. But you mentioned, Tabitha, you don't go back to you first on this one, that, that the Indigenous women are doing something kind of different. Well, it's not something kind of different. It's a lot different in terms of, of business development and whatever. So what's, what's actually going on there? I mean, I think I've, I'm just amazed at the power and, and determination of Indigenous women and how they're kind of changing the nature of how we think of traditional commerce. I think it's just because we're women. <laughs> yeah, so our, st our studies and research that we've done has ac have actually said that indigenous women entrepreneurs are growing faster than, than non. And the like finding new ways to innovate is also a higher percentage in indigenous women entrepreneurs than non as well. Yeah. But, um, and this is, you know, this is very common across all indigenous entrepreneurs, but indigenous women have always 
more more than not had within their business case or business plan. So their major customer is their community or or their their home community. So how are they taking care of their community? That's mm -hmm. that's their major number one priority customer. Um, they all often have majority of them have somewhere within their business plan, how they're giving back to community. So maybe that's scholarships for Indigenous youth to go to school. Maybe it's providing supports um, through mentorships or scholarships, but a large majority of Indigenous women entrepreneurs have always had that within their business case. And there's also this where we see more um, with Indigenous women entrepreneurs, a partnership model. So definitely um, the very the very beginning of COVID, I, I took over this role March of 2020. So very early COVID, actually the day that we moved work from home. Um, and the first Sunday, I got this call from an uh, Indigenous woman saying, I'm going to start these circles on Sundays, uh, just calls. So we had these Zoom calls every Sunday, Indigenous women entrepreneurs just getting there talking about like, how are you doing? How are you going to manage getting through COVID? How is this working for your business? And it turned into a, like, what do you need? And what do you need? And someone's like, well, I need a computer. Well, I have a computer that my kid's not using anymore. I'll like send that out to you in Conan. I really need some new marketing strategy for e-commerce. And Jen Harper, Cheekbone Beauty, actually has a marketing background. She said, I'll sit down with you and like develop a marketing strategy for your business. That like sharing that happened, um, it's now called the Indigenous Lift Circle. They still meet every Sunday. For a while there, we were meeting every Wednesday and Sunday. Um, and then we saw a lot, and you probably would have seen this, we saw a lot of opportunities where they were putting together like boxes with all of their products together to share and help promote and promote each other. So that that is definitely part of uh, what we definitely saw in a, from an Indigenous woman entrepreneur. And that really helped them from a resiliency point of view through COVID. And now, um, we're doing a lot of work on, on trade, particularly Indigenous women businesses. So we have done a couple of trade missions just with Indigenous women ownership. And we are, are going on a trip to present at a conference in April as well um, with Raven Reeds and Yukon Soaps and She Native. So we'll drop a bunch of names in <laughs> there, look them up online. Um, but it's really about that sharing. Like I have this opportunity to go to a conference, who can come with me? And that's something that we've seen has been so strengthened that ecosystem. Fantastic. Any thoughts on Indigenous women? I uh, thank you. I um, you know, the the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls calls to justice. The uh, two hundred and thirty one uh, is there. Please please read it. it it's it's uh, it, it, it validates the toughest person to be in this country is an Indigenous female. I'm uh, just 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 affirming the two things. The uh, when Cowses did our child welfare reform, uh, we asked our question, what's our model? What's the Cowses model? Forget all the Ministry of Social Services over the 65 years, what's our model? So we had this person come in and explain to us, a child to the age of seven is pure. Let them be pure. Just let them be children, let them be pure. But eight to 17, they must learn right from wrong. You, They must know um, you know, what's good to what's not good. And whose role is it to teach them that? It's it's the family, home fire, it's the community, it's it's our at 18, it takes females one year to hit adolescence. It takes men six years to hit adolescence. And we found that out in our model. And I I, I want to attest, I'm glad there wasn't Facebook when I was 22, because I wouldn't be a cheat today. <laughs> but um you know, just, just in just in the own what indigenous world view, you know, that you go back to the traditional governance before Indian Act, before reserves, the women's council made the final decision for the nation, you know, through the ceremony and the songs, you know, the hereditary chief and headmen were the spokespeople, you know, you had your societies and, and there was no children care, no unemployment because the women's council we're always there to, to, to make sure that that decision was made in the in the long term. And you know, to not to to, to bring that to today, indigenous women that's getting that that that's being you know, that that being the fan is the ashes are being fanned and the fire is getting stronger as to how it always should have been. But the challenge remains is the own indigenous worldview in our communities today, we have to adjust. 
We have our own internal reconciliation as First Nation to First Nation. But also in Canada, we also have a role too. So please, we have kind of two guiding principles to make sure that there are all those glass ceilings that are there right now for an Indigenous female entrepreneur. We must break them immediately. Like, like it's not even a, a thinking about it. So you know, we need advocates. We need in every meeting, we need advocates to speak up. Even if there's not an Indigenous person in the room, speak up. You know, and if it's a it's a someone else, speak up because we're gonna get there. But I just want to show you kind of how that history has happened to where we are right now. Alan, I have time for two more questions. Is that okay? And then we're gonna have about 15, 20 minutes of questions from, from here. So we'll get your questions written down. Bob, you're first. <laughs> Put you on the spot. You're kidding, Bob. You don't have to. Um, okay, two more questions. Uh, if I was to look at CCAB. Canadian Council on Aboriginal Business had a huge role to play in well, everything we're talking about. Um, uh, Tab was a predecessor and a friend of mine, J.D. J.P. Glendale, uh, and the people before him did a really good job of taking Indigenous entrepreneurship out of the background and into the in, into the into the spotlight. I think you've done an amazing job with that. Speak to us a little bit about procurement and, and about what that means to what it's meant economically to Indigenous communities. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for raising that. I get in trouble if I went back to the office and I didn't speak about procurement. So um, we it, procurement has been something that we've been focusing on for the last, as one of our major priorities last six years, probably. Yeah. Uh, and partially of that was, so our organization, those who don't know, is a membership association, not for profit. We are members, are indigenous businesses and non-indigenous businesses. And we are about almost 40 years old. And we were originally started by corporate Canada and, and indigenous business leaders. Uh, with the purpose to support Indigenous entrepreneurs, but really from a corporate Canada perspective to say, what can we be doing to support Indigenous, to mentor Indigenous young people, to start businesses, to support Indigenous business. And we firmly believe that procurement is a way that corporations can support growing the Indigenous economy without, you know, it's not more like spend on your budget. It's just about directing where you're spending your money to ensure that you're supporting Indigenous business. So we do see this now. There are, you know, definitely um, in Alberta, oil and gas, uh, Suncor as an example, had a lot for a long time, a 5% procurement requirement from Indigenous business. Last year, actually, I think in 2019, they spent $900 million with Indigenous businesses. And that has had already a generational impact. So we have a new member that joined last year um, indigenous women entrepreneur. And she said, you know, my dad started a business in Fort McMurray. He was an electrician and, and selling to Suncor. If he had not started that business, I probably wouldn't have graduated high school. I definitely wouldn't have started my own business. And now she is, so we're seeing that second generation of impact from that procurement. That is really what we're trying to rebuild from so many generations. Um, and now we're seeing procurement targets like that across corporations across the country and people meeting and exceeding the 5% target. So in 2018, we did a study with the federal government looking at where their spend was uh, the year prior and where Indigenous businesses were across the country and what sectors they were in. And we were able to prove that Indigenous businesses could actually supply close to 24% of the purchasing for one year from the federal government. At that time, the federal government spent less than 1% of their spend in Indigenous business. But in 2019, there was a mandate letter uh, that went to the Minister of Procurement and Minister of Indigenous Service Canada requiring that they work towards a minimum 5% procurement. Um, the federal government spends about $21 billion a year. So that's a billion dollars that could go into the Indigenous economy and into Indigenous businesses, even if they just met that minimum 5%. And again, that's not, that's not more tax dollars. That's not changes, but that change that that procurement can make from an Indigenous business as endo in employs Indigenous people or to an AEDC, that that money is going back to support programming in community, it's going to change social economic outcomes and health outcomes within communities. Um, so that has definitely been over the past, in my time, my, my biggest thing that I've been continuing to push a federal government and provincial government and municipalities. So so pleased to see here in Saskatchewan, cities have now come forward with an Indigenous procurement policy, and we want to be able to see that we can see that in all cities across the country. It's so neat, just before I go to the chief on this one, that, that this came up just before the election in the Yukon, the last election in the Yukon, the Yukon government 
so keep sort of leaked out and said, oh, they're planning an indigenous procurement policy. And the commentary in the press was, okay, the government just lost. There's no way they're going to win now because this is sort of favoring one side over the other. And the issue completely disappeared as an election issue. It turned out that people were quite uncomfortable with the idea of a procurement arrangement that was the gone along the lines you talked about. Chief, has the procurement issue sort of filtered down to the community level? It, it does. It, it makes an impact as well. Uh, two, two quick examples and a quick explanation. Uh, the city of Regina just recently approved their procurement policy. 20% has to go to Indigenous people. The city of Regina has a two, $200 million budget to spend here. So 20% of that in the future is going to affect entrepreneurs, communities, First Nations, and entities. And so that money is going to either get reinvested to make more business or go back to the communities for language, for for things that are not funded through the fiduciary obligation. The second one is, uh, I'm just gonna bring it up. I, I'm not trying to, I'm just creating a case here, but Kakawishtahau and Enbridge, in, uh, anybody has uh, you know, listened or heard on, on certain feeds that uh, Chief Tepetat is upset that Mosaic and Esther Hazy is not purchasing their um, pipe baking uh, company in, in Melbourne. And you know, Enbridge re replied and said, Listen, like we visited your 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 building, you know, we've seen your bids, uh, you know, so forth. You know, so so some are winning and some are not. But I'm just saying those voices are are coming up now. Like those are the discussions. We can't pick sides and and we gotta know why the question is, and this is where I, I like these conversations, is why should indigenous people get a special procurement? Like. A lot of us are educated in the room, are understand and open-minded. We have a whole society that's sitting there saying, well, why the heck do they get special treatment? Well, the thing is, is in 2023, we can't just assume that there's equality. You know, Indigenous people have only been thinking economically and welcomed into the economic world since the late 80s. Like this country is 165 plus years old. And, you know, we are generational corporations here. Indigenous people have only been in our economic economy for 30 years, 35 years. And so, you know, even going home for some, it's tough to talk economics because even in the Indigenous homes, you don't talk economics. You know, we're so used to managing the poverty in our mind and with Kiam and Cree, you know, just don't matter, don't worry about it. And, you know, our humor is, is there to make fun of it and stuff like that. But we're still transitioning from a social managing poverty mind to just being so accustomed and that's just the way life is to now being an entrepreneur you know very a part of so you know that it's transitioning really fast but that's why these procurements is is to get us to equality and parity and so we gotta support these these procurement uh, uh set asides because that's the whole objective is to make things fair and it's delayed gratification we may not see the difference tomorrow, but I tell you, our children will see when we get to that parity. That's a, a brilliant way to summarize it. Both of you have done a great job with that because one of the things that's really interesting, I watched this over the last, say, 50 years. Initially, corporations did this kind of stuff because they felt a moral obligation or they were afraid of being embarrassed. I really hate that phrase of a social license to operate because it sort of means that you, you, you all you have to do is pay a fee. So if you spend a million dollars, you'll get a social license to operate. Well, the reality of it is, I think most businesses have realized the closer you work with Indigenous businesses, the better the business is for everybody. You have local workforce, you have local local suppliers who are right in your neighborhood and that sort of thing. And a lot of the mining companies all across northern Canada have figured this out 10, 15 years ago. And so now it isn't so much a, it isn't a legal obligation. It's actually just really good business and good business that rebounds to everybody's benefit. So I hope you guys all agree. These are brilliant folks. We're really lucky to have them here sharing this with us. I'm going to put you on the spot because I want both of you to be prime minister. Um, I, I used to think it was Jody Wilson Rainbow, uh, right? So, um, but I, I think you guys can be co prime ministers. That'd be a really neat sort of Western Central Canadian model, all this kind of stuff, right? So let's assume. I was going to say, you know, fifty billion dollars used to be a lot after the after the pandemic. It was like Wednesday spending, but but I think just let's assume fifty billion dollars is still a lot of money. You're the prime minister, and you've got fifty billion dollars to spend on accelerating the future of the indigenous economy. Fifty billion dollars. 
Chief, how do you spend? <laughs> not just, he wants all the calluses. It has to go across the whole country. So he has to go first. You, you have to focus on the governance of business. Like you can't just give money to the communities and just sit back and say, good, we fixed the issue. Like, like, like it's, 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 it's you gotta, like right now, for example, uh, we create have and have not communities right now in our own backyard because chief and council think they have to micromanage every business. And the chief and council's role is like just any other politician, your main role is to get reelected. And so, you know, FHQ, they got business out of their chief and council's roles and put it into a corporation. George Gordon has one, Houses has one. And so in order, and I'm talking this money for economics, I'm not trying to solve all the issues. So I'm just trying to focus <laughs> on the economics. But you got to focus on the governance of it. And you, you got to make sure the foundations of, of the governance are there in order to make better. You, you got First Nation Power Authority and then Guy Lone Child who's here. Like Guy Lone Child and First Nation Power Authority is for the nations that want to get into renewable energy in this province, but don't know how to approach SAS power. I don't know how to go about it. You got to support institutions like like First Nation Power Authority. We got to create other sister brother ones like First Nation Power Authority because chief and councils manage poverty 80% of our day. 20% is spent for innovation and economics. That's just a reality. And so chief and council, it's a very bottleneck. You know, there in, in Saskatchewan, we got CIC, Crown Investment Corporations. And, and how in, in, in First Nations, a lot of it is chief and council do it all. And so we got to invest in the governance side of it. We got to invest in things like First Nation Power Authority to be those advocates. And you got to create grants and forgivable grants for your entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs are your heartbeat to your nations and your communities. You don't just focus on the First Nations entities. Your entrepreneurs are going to be, you know, the whole beating drum to, to try to get the economics going, and they're going to meet halfway. And I tell you, once that money is invested in that way, in one generation, you know, we can look at our provincial budgets and see how, you know, the, the justice and the child services and how much of that pie we get, you would see it adjust. But the thing is, is it's tough to think like that because we... Today as a society, expect change now. And it's delayed gratification. Like, is it going to happen? But we're probably not going to see it right away. But, you know, it is going to happen. That's what I would do if elected as prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> so just along those lines, if you, if you don't already know about the First Nations Major Project Coalition, it actually is one of those institutions that's very much like the chief was talking about. It's actually a group that started off with about 10 First Nations who said, we're all too small to get involved in big projects. But if we actually go together, we can get involved in major projects. So they're actually now working together. There's 110 First Nations in the First Nation Major Project Coalition, and they're, they're buying up transmission lines. They're moving proposals to build power dams. They're getting involved in equity investments in main mine, mining and, and pipeline projects. Coastal gasoline project, they own 10%. First Nations own 10%. They were trying to buy another 10%, right? So that kind of institution building is, is basically, what I like the way you're describing it, basically a way of equalizing. It's you know, giving the resources, the, the, the communities a chance to have those resources and that authority. So Prime Minister Tabitha, <laughs> you got your 50 billion. Uh, so I think I would divide it in a few different areas. One is that the federal government does not have an indigenous entrepreneurship strategy across all of government. They have a black entrepreneurship strategy and a women entrepreneurship strategy, but they don't have an indigenous entrepreneurship strategy. It all sits within Indigenous Services Canada. So if you go to ISED or uh, and look for money out of innovation, science, technology, and development and as an indigenous entrepreneur, quite often you're pushed back to IS because other ministries and government just don't know what to do. I'm talking to Indigenous people. So investment in a government-wide entrepreneurship strategy with set-asides within all of the great programs that are out there for entrepreneurs in all of the various ministries would be one area. The other area is on training. Um, 
So we need more Indigenous people in executive leadership positions and on boards across the country in all of the boardrooms of corporate Canada. And there, it's not that there aren't Indigenous leaders out there that can't sit in those tables and aren't prepared to sit in those tables, but um, we need to find a way or an institution to be built in order to ensure that we're preparing and readying those Indigenous leaders to be sitting in those, in those places of decision making. Um, and the last would be an Indigenous equity clean energy fund. Guy, do you want to like step up and? <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we look in Ontario, we had something called an Aboriginal Loan Guarantee. In Alberta, we have a AIOC. Uh, but we need a federal fund that supports communities and Indigenous uh, partnerships to be able to be part of the clean energy tradition transition. So be able to have that equity and, and be backed. Uh, by the government to be able to be equity partners in these projects. So not just be, these are a number of jobs and here's like $100,000, but to be owners. Um, so that would be a, a large portion of the $50 billion. I love the both of the examples, but when the Marshall decision came down in 1999, it caught the federal government unawares. The Big Mac Mountain Seed and Pasquale won the right to fish for commercial purposes for the first time as a, as a treaty right very important decision. And the government had absolutely no idea what to do. They just sort of went in hiding for three months and they and they actually came out over time with the Aboriginal, uh, Atlantic Aboriginal fishing strategy. And they provided funds so that indigenous people could buy boats. They can be trained as captains, they've been trained as crew operators. They now own Clearwater, they own a billion dollar company in the area. There are more than a thousand indigenous commercial fishers in the Maritimes, um, more than there were in 1999, a thousand. And by the way, out there, earning between 150 and a million dollars a year is not unusual in the lobster and crab fisheries. We're not talking here about people who are catching a few grayling off the back of the boat. They're making a lot of money at this, right? Now the biggest problem is there's so many people who want in, First Nations people who want in. But the exact, a proof of your concept, you know, what they needed was the opportunity. They had no money to buy a boat for historical reasons. and no training because the school systems, college systems let them down. Give them training, give them money. They're very successful fishers now. And they've set the whole industry in the Maritimes absolutely on its head. Brilliant answers, wonderful. We've got time for, do we have time? Questions? Yes. Yes, I'm just going to grab the mic, Ken, so we can. Oh, wonderful, okay. <laughs> this is how Alan justifies his flight here. <laughs> Um, uh, people have questions, so please raise your hands and Alan will bring it over to you. And try to keep your questions short so that we can have long answers. Thank you very much. I'll try to speak loud. My name's Ken, and I come from a family of seven. I have siblings. Well, one owns a business. I have a sibling that farms. I need a regular paycheck from an employer. And I did go through a process in my career where I went through a sifting process to see if I could be successful as an entrepreneur, and I couldn't. So my question is, I'm sure not everybody in your community is here to be a, an entrepreneur. Do you have a bit of a sifting process to make sure that they fit? Great question. How do they want to answer that one first? <laughs> you know it not. 180 years ago, in, in a governance structure for an Indigenous nation, there was no unemployment. Everybody had a purpose. Everybody had a duty. Because you were raised from a little baby knowing all the legendary stories and, and knowing what society you grew up in and, and they raised you to be a undergrad, master's and PhD in that society. Um, today in our communities, uh, we are on a healing journey. Um, and in our communities, you, you got entrepreneurs. Uh, they're just born entrepreneurs and they got amazing ideas and, and we just got to, you know, lead them to the to the field to make it happen some are just born public servants they're going to work at your band office they're going to work at your local your, your store like they're that's 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 you know they, they like it. some are venturous they're going to move off the reserve they're going to you know go make a life uh, somewhere else but the thing is their heart's always back at home so you know the challenge is is our communities are not built like a regina 
They're not built like a pilot butte. They're, it's like a rocket going into the sky. It, it, you're going to burn a lot of fuel to get the orbit. But once you get the orbit, you're not going to burn as much gas. That's what we need in our communities right now. We need that big investment to make sure that the, the internet is, is strong there. To make sure that because business is is internet today, you, you can't do business without internet today. Pretty much in any industry, um, you need um, uh, just just hubs. You just need the right hubs for 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 business. And your clientele is usually not always in the community; it's in the city. So how you know how's your commute and 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 stuff like that? It's not everybody has a car. Some people rely on. You know the expertise of a transportation system, and, and you don't have that. So, so it, it is a challenge. And, and is it getting better? I don't think it is right now. I, I think it still is status quo. And uh, unfortunately, people leave their reserve to move to the cities for opportunities. And and I hope one day that isn't a norm. I hope that it goes back and forth. But, but right now, there I don't. Uh, I I've been chief for seven years and. I think we've improved on houses. I think we have, you know, more access, but we're still not at that level of parity of even a town yet. Yeah. And just a quick observation that you, one of these questions about government policy, what does government do? In Northern Scandinavia, where they have very similar remote communities and isolated places, they actually only have one policy. And the policy is all communities in these areas will have roughly the same public services as any community in Norway. Of course, it costs more money. You're more isolated and whatever else. So you go into the road communities, the roads are paved. I love taking people on the prairies here, uh, people who are from Saskatchewan, and you drive into a First Nations reserve, and the roads are really nicely paved <laughs> until you hit the edge of the reserve. And then it's all dusty, right? And you know, well, what's all this about? And you know what it's about, right? But in Norway, that wouldn't happen. And you wouldn't have problems with water supply. And you wouldn't have a doctor resident in town and nurses in town and teachers that don't turn over all the time. Mm -hmm. Very simple policies, right? But in fact, we bury it down to a thousand ministries and federal provincial relations. Next question. Thank you. Um, thank you both uh, for uh, while well, I have to rip off here today. Um, my name is uh, Jordan. I'm a director of policy for the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. Um, so this question is, is for you, Tabitha. I heard that you're on the board of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Um, so my question is, uh, and, and it's, it's super simple, is how, how do you see the chamber network right across the country um, best working to support Indigenous people and, and businesses? Yeah, great question. So um, we're actually working with Ontario Chamber of Commerce, we'll be releasing soon, but in partnership with them on developing a kind of like a reconciliation. So we did a reconciliation guidebook for federal government to help support uh, non-Indigenous businesses understand basic things about how best to work with communities and how best to work with Indigenous businesses. So how to, how to you know, the requirements to do call for awareness training within your organization, the requirements to look at Indigenous employment across your organization, your procurement targets from Indigenous businesses. So um, we are working with Ontario Chamber of Commerce to do something very specific for Ontario. So really help uh, Ontario businesses understand the different treaties within the province of Ontario, the different communities, um, and to try to help them start to make those connections. Ontario Chamber of Commerce is also, uh, will be having an Indigenous Advisory Council of Ontario First Nation and Métis leaders that will help support them in this work if they continue to look. And, uh, you know, Ontario Chamber of Commerce, similar to Saskatchewan, does a lot of policy advocacy work as well in the province. So they have a voice that they can, you know, as I said earlier, like bring to those tables and they're wanting to understand how best they can support Indigenous businesses and bring that voice to those important tables and conversations that they have as well. So that's part of the work that Ontario Chamber is doing in that space. But they also are, are doing you know, a great job at ensuring that when they have events, they're bringing Indigenous businesses to all of the different panels that they have. So they're having much more representation than they ever have in the past. Um, one thing we've also done just at the board level is so our land acknowledgement um, at the beginning of every board meeting, we a different board member takes turns doing the land acknowledgement at each board meeting, but they have to talk about where they live and where they're not like where the office of our 
our chamber is, but where they come from, where they live and what the land acknowledgement is and the history um, in their area of where they live. And it has been an incredible. So we've done this now at five meetings, um, but a different board member has come and really talked about their own experience and the treaty and what, what happened there long before they settled there. And it's been a really great learning opportunity of way to start, start the meeting. Great. Thank you. What other questions? Um, so we have a program in Western Canada and, and, and I've worked here for many years. It's called the Indigenous Business Development Services, and and uh, and I have talked with Chief Cadmus a number of times, and so it's great to hear you because, I mean, you're my hero. <laughs> but I, I do think that it's extremely important to understand that there are programs out there that are actually we're federally funded. It's a it's a program, you know, a project that goes gets renewed maybe every year for many years, and then. Now it's going to be maybe renewed for three years, but we've worked with hundreds of indigenous businesses, both on reserve and off reserve, um, getting them through, pathfinding them through that process of, of becoming established. And during the pandemic, uh, we partnered with Direct West and we partnered, now we partner with Vendasta and Prairie Valley Consulting. And, and we, we work as a team to help our indigenous people move forward through this system. And, and I think it's been a very effective process. I mean, we've seen wonderful successes and great turnarounds. And so I think that there's a piece of communication that seems to be missing is that we really don't even know all of the programming that is out there that should be coordinating efforts. I mean, I took a lot of notes on procurement because we've talked about that a number of times. How do we get our entrepreneurs into the procurement program? And so I just think that the more we talk, the more we communicate, the more you offer these opportunities for all of us that are involved in, in business development, economic development, um, governance. I mean, the stronger we're going to become as a province and as a country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Superhero Chief. <laughs> uh, thanks for the kind words. Um, you know, SAS power in this province, I'll just give you an example. Um, and then and I'm going to go back to the hubs. Uh, you made a comment, I just want, but SAS power in this, this province, when a renewable energy project is coming to this province, SAS power asks the industry, who is your Indigenous partner? not do you have one or how much indigenous are you going to hire? And so it makes these companies, because a lot of them come from outside the province, Google First Nations in Saskatchewan to see what, and who comes up first is cows is because we've been it for so long. And, you know, that's why First Nation Power Authority is here is to, to be that. Help. But I just like how, you know, you're creating a, a nudge nudge in policy to like not do you have one, but who is? But the other thing is, is, is in this city, there is a hair salon called Miosuin. Indigenous um, mother and, and husband own it with kids. And uh, I'm really close, close with Jen. Um, and I've watched this female Indigenous entrepreneur through the pandemic and even post pandemic and just how tough it is. And um we're trying to direct her to apply for grants and to apply for this. A lot of indigenous entrepreneurs like Jen, we know they're out there. We just don't know where they are. And we have to create some kind of nice freeway because a lot of them should be focusing on making their business successful, but yet they're focusing so much energy and they're worrying so much on just trying to get their fixed from their variables going. So somehow in this country, we have to, in province, create an easy access hub to entrepreneurs to just go to instead of just hit and miss and searching. And industries have to invest as well. I'll give you one last example. And, and I'm saying something Jen should be saying herself, but she was having a real tough couple months. And just out of nowhere, she got this check from uh, Mazda. And it like just made her whole, she's like, I didn't know what to do. Mazda sent me a, like a couple thousand dollars. Someone applied for her to Mazda because Mazda had this economic COVID-19 relief. And Mazda mailed her a check 
She's like, I don't even drive a Mazda. She said, like, <laughs> but I mean, like Mazda doing that, helping one entrepreneur in our city. Like she is now like in a better place. But at that time, Mazda was her winner. Like all companies can probably be that extra hug for a lot of entrepreneurs. So, I mean, those are the two things I would just suggest for, for creating an easier access. I was uh, did a, did a study in the Yukon in the 1990s. They asked me to sort of look at the number of programs for Aboriginal business support and business development. 75. There are 75 different programs in the Yukon territory alone, right? So the Yukon government created a, a one-stop shop. They don't go to all those places, come to a one-stop shop. They only look after 15. So there were 60 other shops you had to go to. And if you went to the one-stop shop, they said, oh, you, you know, Chief Kavish, you have this wonderful business plan. You can't pay, figure it out. We've hired some non-Aboriginal person to fill in the forms for you. Well, it didn't work. Big, not a big surprise. We have a chance for, uh, oh, please, please. I, I Cheryl and I, I completely agree on the hub. So it's something we also, and especially during COVID, there were so many different supports out there, provincially and regionally and federally, that also a lot of our Indigenous business members were just trying to navigate which one worked. And I will tell you that there was a, there was a navigator program that was put out by the federal government. And I said this because we were pushing to have an indigenous one. And I called, just called and said I was a business and <laughs> made up a call. And then I said, well, you know, I'm on reserve. So does this work for on reserve? And they could not answer my question, put me on hold, put me to someone else, which is why we need something that's focused for indigenous business. So Indigenous Service Canada is launching a navigator program that is supposed to be supporting businesses in this way, but we'll, we'll see how it gets refined. But I would also say to the point of $2,500 and um, we have had so many corporations come forward to us that are, are our members. So Meta, Google, Hydro One, Dow Canada, Paper Excellence, LNG Canada, who have come forward and said, we just want to support Indigenous businesses. And we've been able to give out 250 grants of $2,500. Like, just here is the money. And the difference is, because we are also um, providing the Canadian Digital Adoption Program to businesses as well to support them in digital adoption, again, for $2,500. But that's a federally funded program that we're delivering for the federal government. So that requires, you need to prove you need it, you need to provide a reimbursement receipt, like you have to spend the money first and then be reimbursed, which really doesn't work for entrepreneurs and is so much extra paperwork and time that they don't have. So the great thing about these corporations coming forward and just saying, hey, we wanna support indigenous businesses, what can we do? Like you do it how you want and we just say, apply and we have a we actually have this little wheel <laughs> we really everybody gets on a webinar call and we do a little wheel and it's like a twenty five hundred dollars here you go and the crazy thing is so when we did it for um with meta initially we had 150 125 grants available and you have it was like we opened applications within 59 minutes we had 150 applications the, the need out there from entrepreneurs is so significant and $2,500 might not seem like a lot, but it is a huge amount of relief for an entrepreneur. Yes. So corporate partners have really stepped up. Wonderful. Alan, do you want to leave the last word with you or? Thank you, Ken. Uh, before I, I offer a last word, let me just remind you that on the other side of these doors is some food and beverage. I would invite you to help yourself and, and stay around for a little bit. We can chat with some of the panelists or with each other. We have that opportunity. That <clears throat> was awesome. Uh, equal parts educational and <laughs> inspiring. And so my last word to all three of you is just to say, and please join me in saying thank you. Thank you.